You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. And we'll get it together sooner or later here, folks. Well, we were supposed to have a medal report from uh, Gene Miller, but he hasn't called, so we're going to go right into the program, and uh, I guess he'll have to do it on this hour tomorrow night. Right off the bat, I want to read a letter here from uh, a listener named John who sent the reply from the office of Arlen Specter, United States Senator for Pennsylvania. Dear Mr. John, thank you for contacting my office regarding your request for Public Law 87-297. In an effort to be as helpful as possible, I have contacted the Senate document room who informs me that Public Law 87-297 is currently out of stock with no authority to reprint. Again, thank you for contacting me. Please let me know if I can be of further assistance on this or any other matter of concern. Sincerely, Arlen Specter. And uh, John encloses a little note at the bottom. Dear Bill, this is the reply I received from the Specter staff to my request for Public Law 87-297 and State Department Paper Number 7277. I called Washington and told them that 87297 can be found on page 652 of Volume 9 of Title 22, United States Code 1988 edition. I thank you for providing this information. I went on to inform the Specter staff that as a citizen I am entitled to be allowed to learn the law and requested that they make a photocopy of the page specified and to send that photocopy of 87-297 to my location. I have received a copy of the booklet State Department paper number 7277 from the John Birch Society. It is exactly what you said it was, a written plan to disarm America. You have my permission to quote from these letters. God bless you, John. So folks... Don't let them get away with it. You see, since we ran the treason series, they have been telling you that the public laws are out of print and no longer available, and that is a blatant lie. Not only are they in print and available to all senators and congressmen in Washington, D.C., the Justice Department, the President of the United States, the Library of Congress, and every library in this country. So don't let these scumbag, creepo, treasonous traitors get away with it. Call them on it, just like John did. And make sure that you force their hand every single time. Otherwise, they will ride right over you. In the earlier hour of the hour of the time, we began a new series on the Rose Cross College, and I quoted verbatim from a book entitled The Rose Cross College, edited by R. Swineburn Clymer, copyrighted 1917. A resume of the teachings and proceedings of the Rose Cross College during its session held in the month of October 1916 on the 400th anniversary of the founding of the Order. The Imperialistic Council and Venerable Order of the Magi, its instructions in the official degree, Priests of Melchizedek, the Knights of Chivalry, and Order of the Holy Grail. So folks, if you missed that hour, make sure that you order the tape. For non-CAGI members, tapes are $8 post-paid. For CAGI members, they're $6 post-paid. You may order tapes by sending your money to William Cooper, P.O. Box 1420, SHOLO, spelled S-H-O-W-L-O-W, Arizona, 
84-8901. That's P.O. Box 1420, Sholo, Arizona, 85901. In the beginning of this book, it described the initiation <laughs> in the Grove of Osiris and uh, many other things, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, you need to know. The ancient degrees of Osiris were conferred upon the delegates during that period of time in 1916 and uh, you know I put out some hints for you people to be examining the Greitz spike training tape that there was some symbolism there some of you did most of you as usual stayed on your butts and didn't do anything and many of you have been sucked in by Mr. Trojan Horse himself Lieutenant Colonel James Bobo Gritz if you look real closely at his spike training literature and his spike training video, you will see that spike is spelled S-P-Obelisk-K-E. S-P-Obelisk-K-E. Now, for those of you who don't know what that means, S-P, Penis of Osiris, K-E. He's playing you for a fool. And again, just like all the others, he is laughing at you. A day and a half spike training, uh-huh and he teaches you how to fight with a double-edged blade and tells you that you are now a member of Delta Force. Let me read to you from a dictionary of Freemasonry exactly what Delta means and during a later program ladies and gentlemen we will play a tape, a briefing tape for high-ranking officers in the United States Army on the 1st Earth Battalion which describes again what Task Force Delta is really all about. Delta, the name of the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. In form it is a triangle and was considered by the ancient Egyptians a symbol of fire and also of God in the Scottish and French systems and also that of the Knights Templar the triangle or Delta is a symbol of the unspeakable name. And we go back a little farther, ladies and gentlemen. I-N-R-I. -I. Jesus, Nazarenus Rex, Udiorum. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the inscription which was placed upon the cross of the Savior. In the Philosophical Lodge, they represent fire, salt, sulfur, and mercury. In the system of the Rosicrucians, they had a similar use. Igne natura renovatur integra meaning literally, by fire, nature is perfectly renewed. This idea is also found in the degree of night's adepts of the eagle or of the sun. Remember, fire is connected to delta. Remember that they burn their enemies to purify the soul so that the enemies will not come back after them. Don't go away. You, you, my dear sheeple, have an awful lot to learn. governments are controlled and operated by a few, not with the thought of producing the most good for the greatest number of people, but to obtain power and riches for the few at the expense of the many. The few are waiting in streams of gold while the many are growing under hard burdens. In the myths surrounding King Arthur and the Round Table and those knights of the Holy Grail who were the forerunners of the Order of the Garter and other knighthoods, one particularly is worthy of interpretation, demonstrating as it does the use and abuse of power. The story of Merlin is soon told. Merlin was the son of no mortal father, but of an incubus, one of a class of beings not absolutely wicked, but far from good, who inhabited regions of the air. Merlin's mother was a virtuous young woman who on the birth of her son entrusted him to a priest who hurried him to the baptismal font. And so saved him from sharing the lot of his father, though he retained many marks of his unearthly origin. At this time, Vortigern reigned in Britain. He was a usurper who had caused the death of his sovereign, Moines, and driven the two brothers of the late king, whose names were Uther and Pendragon, into banishment. 
Vortigern, who lived in constant fear of the return of the rightful heirs of the kingdom, began to erect a strong tower for defense. The edifice, when brought by the workmen to a certain height, three times fell to the ground without any apparent cause. The king consulted his astrologers on this wonderful event and learned from them that it would be necessary to bathe the cornerstone of the foundation with the blood of a child born without a mortal father. In search of such an infant, Vortigern sent his messengers all over the kingdom, and they by accident discovered Merlin, whose lineage seemed to point him out as the individual wanted. They took him to the king, but Merlin, young as he was, explained to the king the absurdity of attempting to rescue the fabric by such means, for he told him the true cause of the instability of the tower was its being placed over the den of two immense dragons whose combats shook the earth above them. The king ordered his workmen to dig beneath the tower, and when they had done so they discovered two enormous serpents, the one white as milk, the other red as fire. The multitude looked on with amazement till the serpents, slowly rising from their den and expanding their enormous folds, began the combat. When everyone fled in terror, except Merlin, who stood by, clapping his hands and cheering on the conflict, the red dragon was slain, and the white one, gliding through a cleft in the rock, disappeared. These animals typified, as Merlin afterwards explained, the invasion of Uther and Pendragon, the rightful princes, who soon after landed with a great army. Vortigern was defeated, and afterwards burned alive in the castle he had taken such pains to construct. On the death of Vortigern, Pendragon ascended the throne. Merlin became his chief advisor, and often assisted the king by his magical arts. Merlin, who knew the range of all their arts, had built the king his havens, ships, and halls. Vivienne. Merlin continued to be a favorite counselor through the reigns of Pendragon, Uther, and Arthur, and at last disappeared from view and was no more found among men through the treachery of his mistress, Vivienne the fairy, which happened in this wise. Merlin, having become enamored of the fair Vivienne, the Lady of the Lake, was weak enough to impart to her various important secrets of his art, being impelled by fatal destiny, of which he was at the same time fully aware. The Lady, however, was not content with his devotion, unbounded as it seems to have been, but cast about. The romance tells us how she might detain him forevermore and one day addressed him in these terms. Sir, I would that we should make a fair place and a suitable so contrived by art and by cunning that it might never be undone and that you and I should be there in joy and solace. My lady, said Merlin, I will do all this. Sir, said she, I would not have you do it, but you shall teach me and I will do it and then it will be more to my mind. I grant you this, said Merlin. Then he began to devise, and the damsel put it all in writing, and when he had devised the whole, then had the damsel full great joy, and showed him greater semblance of love than she had ever before made, and they sojourned together a long, long while. At length it fell out that as they were going one day hand in hand through the forest of Brasiliand, they found a bush of white thorn which was laden with flowers, and they seated themselves under the shade of this white thorn upon the green grass, and Merlin laid his head upon the damsel's lap and fell asleep. Then the damsel rose and made a ring with her wimple round the bush and round Merlin, and began her enchantments such as he himself had taught her. And nine times she made the ring, and nine times she made the enchantment, and then she went and sat down by him, and placed his head again upon her lap. And when he awoke and looked around him, it seemed to him that he was enclosed in the strongest tower in the world, and laid upon a fair bed. Then said he to the dame, My lady, you have deceived me, unless you abide with me, for no one hath power to unmake this tower but you alone. She then promised she would be often there, and in this she held her covenant with him. 
and Merlin never went out of that tower where his mistress Vivienne had enclosed him, but she entered and went out again when she listed. After this event Merlin was never more known to hold converse with any mortal but Vivienne except on one and only one occasion. Arthur, having for some time missed him from his court, sent several of his knights in search of him, and among the number Sir Gawain, who met with a very unpleasant adventure while engaged in this quest, happening to pass a damsel on his road and neglecting to salute her, as all true knights should, she revenged herself for his incivility by transforming him into a hideous dwarf. He was bewailing aloud his evil fortune, as he went through the forest of Brasiliand, when suddenly he heard the voice of one groaning on his right hand, and looking that way, he could see nothing save a kind of smoke which seemed like air, and through which he could not pass. Merlin then addressed him from out of the smoke, and told him by what misadventure he was imprisoned there. Ah, sir, he added, you will never see me more, and that grieves me, but I cannot remedy it. I shall never more speak to you, nor to any other person, save only my mistress. But do thou hasten to King Arthur, and charge him for me to undertake without delay the quest of the sacred grail. The knight is already born, and has received a knighthood at his hands, who is destined to accomplish the quest. And after this he comforted Gawain under his transformation, assuring him that he should speedily be dischanted and he predicted to him that he should find the king at Carduel in Wales on his return, and that all the other knights who had been on like quest would arrive there the same day as himself, and all this came to pass, as Merlin had said. Now the interpretation of this story, ladies and gentlemen, goes something like this. To those questioning the statement, that men were ever born half-human, as it were, or that Merlin could be the son of an earth maiden and an inhabitant of another sphere, are referred to the Bible. You see, it says, quote, Sons of the gods, seeing that the daughters of men were fair, had intercourse with them, and children were born, unquote. Throughout the scriptures, incubi, beings of the air, are called gods. The soul, before it became submerged in matter, dwelt in a negative sphere, according to the mysteries, knowing neither good nor evil, never having had experience. The infinite allowed the souls to incarnate in flesh, that they might eat of the tree of life, and learn of life and death, good and evil. Now remember, this is the philosophy of the mysteries. It is in no way what I believe. The incubi, possessing not the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water, cannot know immortality, but their children, through the instrumentality of earth mothers, pass under the law of humans, and having lived upon the earth, may receive the blessing of immortality. Now remember the definition of the inscription placed upon the cross above Christ's, Christ's head, the definition that I read to you from the Dictionary of Freemasonry. To secure this great boon, the mother of Merlin summoned the priest, that through the power of priestly invocation he might be bound to earth and earth conditions. It was believed in those early days, and there is much truth back of the assertion, that the influence of the church being invoked was powerful enough to counteract or at least neutralize any inherited evil characteristics. It proved impossible to erase all traces of Merlin's non-earthly parentage, for he possessed an innate knowledge of the mysteries and also the power to use magic. Vortigern, the usurper who succeeded to the throne through murder, was in league with the black magicians. He consulted astrologers who prescribed a blood sacrifice to prevent further disaster. Now, the early knighthoods consisted of two classes of men those allied with the black magicians who resorted to blood sacrifice and other fiendish practices to appease the gods and those who seeking the holy grail defended their religion country and womanhood 
The building of the tower and its demolition may be interpreted in symbolic language as man, in whom the higher and lower principles are constantly in a struggle for supremacy. Red signifies evil, while good is always represented by white. That was carried over in the old westerns, where the good guy always wore the white hat, and the bad guy always wore the black. Merlin, a knight by birth, understanding both black and white magic, advised Vortigern to free the two demons and allow them to battle to the death. Remember, these are the demons within man. The fight ended in the vanquishment of the red dragon, or evil, symbolic of the final event in every struggle between good and evil forces. This was the beginning of the downfall of Vortigern. Having depended upon evil for support, he was left helpless at the death of his ally. With the return of Uther and Pendragon and their armies, Vortigern was defeated and burned alive in his castle. Now translated with the aid of symbolism, the defeat would read as follows, ladies and gentlemen. Every life, devoted and upheld by evil forces, sooner or later faces destruction. When his race is run, the powers of good forsake him, and evil continues the work of annihilation. Every human being is given the power of choosing whom he will serve. If he surrenders to evil, he, not God, pronounces his doom. But thou avengest what men commit against themselves, seeing when they sin against thee, they do wickedly against their own souls, and iniquity gives itself the lie by corrupting and perverting their nature. And, of course, the end is darkness, death, destruction. Merlin, because of magical arts, was chief advisor to the new king. White magic in the knightly brotherhoods was a religion scientifically based on demonstrable laws manifested through invocations. Though strong, there was one weak spot in the armor of Merlin. The beauty and seductiveness of a woman brought him to desolation. Through the weakness of his love nature, he permitted himself to break the greatest of all oaths, that oath of secrecy taken by all knights to protect the secrets of the order even to the death. The result, ladies and gentlemen, was automatic. The law is inexorable. Those who betray shall be betrayed. In trusting to the love and loyalty of the woman whose secrets committed to his keeping, he made her the executor of the decree of his oath. In taking the oath of knighthood, man is supposed to be free from all slavery. Whether sex or habit, before presenting himself for membership. Otherwise, he but places himself in a position of pearl and jeopardizes his soul. The legends of Merlin and Samson are alike in outline and meaning. Both became slaves of women, casting aside honor, truth, and loyalty. The foundation stones of the power of the knight of the order are the master of the mysteries. The pitiful picture of Merlin in his last speech to any man is significant. You see, imprisoned in the tower of his disloyalty, he yet remembers the quest of knighthood, and he sends word to King Arthur, charging him to seek the Holy Grail, and that the knight destined to find it has already been born. The legends of Eros and Psyche, which we explored in the earlier episode of The Hour of the Time, and this legend of Merlin illustrate the most important lessons in the career of a knight. In the first, the effects of doubt, fear, and disobedience are brought to mind. The second charges him to conserve his strength and forces, to preserve an independence of all slavish habits, to protect and defend his oath, to hold in remembrance the sacredness of the mission of the search for the Holy Grail. And remember, in the earlier hour, ladies and gentlemen, we learned that to the mysteries, the Holy Grail represents the soul. The soul. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. And they don't even believe that most people have a soul until they prepare the body to receive it.
<laughs> so you are learning you are learning much faster than you ever could on your own skipping ahead in this respect the pyramid is a perfect symbol of man when he has reached the state called illumination of soul our soul consciousness or in other words has found the center or located the all-seeing eye skipping ahead again may we look to masonry in completing the great work or will it continue to be purely materialistic let this be the mission of masonry to perfect the work for which its outer symbology stands shall it be so this is an admission that they are purely materialistic at this point and have been throughout their history while this is truly a Masonic work the work for which the Mason has made a good foundation when he has completed his three degrees yet it is also a work for every man and especially a work for those who have taken up or who have opportunity and inclination to take up the special training offered freely today by the representatives of the ancient schools through the Illuminati sons of Osiris Magi and other fraternities skipping ahead again several pages the fire philosophy is the basis of all religious mysteries and all the secret philosophies of the universe it is also the underlying principle on which all secret occult brotherhoods are founded it was taught in the ancient mysteries and although the knowledge of it has long been lost to the world it has always been preserved in the occult fraternities the aim of all true initiation no matter what the name of the fraternity may be is to know the nature of the secret fire that regenerates the world and which renders him who comes into its possession immortal the mystic has always held that masonry was one of the basis upon which religion was founded that the mysteries of masonry when fully understood are the same as the ancient mysteries and therefore the mysteries of religion itself the way to godhood be thou a man and thou mayest be a god be a man and thou mayest be a god this is the divine command of the new age the new commandment teaches how to live that manhood shall be the first great stage of growth and that godhood may follow manhood lieutenant colonel james bogreitz is a 32nd degree freemason of the scottish rite he is a member of the Mormon Church and has been initiated in the temple ceremony in which it is revealed to him that Lucifer is the God that he follows, that Christ had his chance on earth and failed, and that it is Lucifer's turn. This can be found and referenced and confirmed fully in a book entitled The God Makers and in the videotape by the same name. Don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move to another book entitled The Teachings of the Masters, The Wisdom of the Ages, An Exposition of the Ever-Active and Constantly Operating Spiritual Laws, Applicable Not Only to the Regeneration of Man, Changing Mortality into Immortality, transmuting the Son of Man into a Son of God, but equally potent in helping man to achieve success and economic independence, health, strength of body, and the peace of mind and heart called heaven. Below that is the symbol of a Christian cross, upon which is the caducus, two serpents entwined about the winged staff. Enlarged and completely revised, together with many additions by Reverend Dr. R. Swineburn Clymer, Director General Church of Illumination, Supreme Grand Master of the International Confederation of Initiates, Supreme Grand Master of the merged occult fraternities comprising the Priesthood of Ith, the Rosicrucian Order, the Secret Schools, the Hermetic Brotherhood, Fraternitas Rosicrucius, Temple of the Rosy Cross, the Order of the Magi, Sons of Isis and Osiris, Illuminati Americani, which translated means the American Illuminati. Published by the Philosophical Publishing Company, Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania. Copyright 1952 by Beverly Hall Corporation, all rights reserved. Prologue. 
Early in the year 1916, instructions were received from the Count M. de Saint Vincent, Supreme Hierarch of the Fraternitas Rosicrucius, to make preparations for a sacred convocation on the 68th anniversary of the establishment of the Supreme Grand Dome of the Fraternitas and Associate Organizations as established in America by Dr. Paschal Beverly Randolph. At this convocation, which was to convene on June 1, 1916, the neophyte body was to be informed of a crisis that would be the beginning of the enslavement of the people of America in a manner so insidious that they would not be aware of it. America was to become engaged in a war that would be only the beginning of greater wars. It was prophesied that an effort would be made to destroy the Christian religion so secretly and silently that only the alert and elect would be aware of this activity. This effort is in full bloom today and is making atheists out of millions, even before their churches are destroyed, the reverse of what has happened and is happening in other countries. At this convocation, we were instructed to hold daily lectures on subjects vitally important to all, in fact, to all the world, and more especially so to neophytes of the August Fraternity. These instructions were to be after the manner of Plato and the Round Table of King Arthur. In addition, we were to prepare for the exemplification of the entire ritual of the Fraternity, Sons of Osiris, up to and including the Royal Purple Degree the ultimate of ancient ritualistic initiation symbolizing the neophytes travels and efforts beginning with the first step and including the final step which is the second or spiritual birth so ladies and gentlemen you are now beginning to learn some things that you thought was absolutely impossible and I've told you on many episodes of the hour of the time that none of this in his hidden anyone can find it anyone that is except sheeple who are too lazy to get up and look those who will may I am a messenger do not doubt that ever and the message that I am bringing you is clear it is concise and there can be no mistake in its interpretation. You must wake up now or be enslaved. The war has begun many years ago. The war was declared by our enemies upon us. We are absolutely within our rights to restore our nation using any method or any manner that is required in so doing. You had better listen. Some years ago, our Swinburne climber, following his graduation as a physician and author of many books, among them The Mysticism of Masonry, the Rosicrucians, their teachings, the mysteries of Osiris, a book for members only, the philosophy of fire, soul science and immortality, and more than 30 other works, bought a mountainous tract of land, and on this was built Beverly Hall, an assembly hall, press room, chemical laboratories, which surrounded by orchards, vineyards, and rose gardens, set amongst terrace lawns presents a splendid combination of the beautiful and practical and upon the front lawns there are perfect duplicates of the three pyramids of Giza and to this was added the mystic or arcane for folks in a secluded and wooded tract of 50 acres of this land an artificial lake was built from a mountain stream a throne room erected for the explication of the royal third degree of Osiris and the seal of Solomon built under the protection of a mighty oak. The temple of the sun, an exact duplicate of that in the outer courtyard of the Vatican, an exact duplicate of the separated four sections of that which can be found in Dili Plaza. The obelisk, the phallus of Osiris, which can be found in New York, in London, in the Vatican, 
and in Dealey Plaza. The Grove of Osiris, represented in Dealey Plaza by Elm Street. Wake up. During the period of the convocation, the teachers and delegates delivered many lectures on the subjects of eugenics, scientific motherhood, code of ethics, spiritual Christianity. And that's a laugh when you discover what it is. Initiation, reincarnation, soul development, the four square man, mystic significance of the seal of the United States and other important subjects all interpreted in their arcane significance by the masters of the sea, spelled S-E-E. -E. Moses was well versed in all the mysteries of Egypt while Joseph took the Nazarene to Egypt where he was educated. The Nazarene, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus Christ. This is what they claim. They claim that no ceremony of the greater mysteries was ever permitted unless the circle or seal of Solomon, also known as the sacred seal of equilibrium, had been previously prepared. Since the fall of Egypt and the Temple of Solomon, the seal has received little or no attention except by a limited few students and neophytes of ancient religion and the mysteries. During the first week in June, in the grove, so carefully prepared for the dramatization of the ancient initiation into the mysteries of Osiris, the ritual in its entirety was reenacted by those present. The seal of Solomon, which had been especially built for the purpose, was dedicated on June the 11th, 1916, in the presence of the members and delegates of the Rosy Cross, some of whom were natives of Germany, England, and White Russia. This was in accordance with and after the manner of the system practiced by the ancient initiate priests of Egypt and the altar in the Temple of Solomon. On the night of June 13th, the first section of the delegation, including those of the order taking part in the initiation, assembled in the Grove of Osiris under the majestic oak, the whole illuminated from a central powerhouse prepared for the initiation ceremonies of the ancient mysteries of Egypt, in three degrees and six scenes. Three degrees and six scenes represented by the number 18 are 666. It is the number of a man. That man is the illumined man who has passed the travails of the three degrees in six acts. It is the man. It is the Antichrist it is the rulers of the new world order. I'm going to skip ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, for we must go to that portion that is relevant to what you need to learn tonight. And we will continue. If we do not finish tonight, and I guarantee you we will not, we will finish sometime in the future, but we will continue on consecutive nights with this until we do. Few Americans of the present day have the slightest idea of how fortunate they are and that they are living in the greatest freest nation that ever existed despite its many shortcomings. Now remember I'm reading this from the book Teachings of the Masters. Neither are they aware that America the land overshadowed with wings is at the crossroads one leading to greater freedom both individual and universal, and the other to the most abject and degrading serfdom as a result of failing to accept the full responsibility for the management of their personal and governmental affairs so that these may harmonize with the ancient prophecies. Remember, I warned you, and I told you that is exactly what is happening. This was the great experiment. If you had proven worthy, this could have been the New World Order, sheeple. 
A still lesser number are aware that the history of America from its very beginning to the end of its days, whether for good or ill, is told in its seal, exactly as I have told you on past programs. While only the very few know that their own destiny is irrevocably interwoven with the destiny of America, America the last trying chamber for human souls, and that when this trial is over, either heaven or hell will reign supreme. Few care, because they selfishly think only of themselves, they forget the future welfare of their sons and daughters. And of course, we saw that when you all patted your sons and daughters on the butt and sent them off to die in a war in the desert in the Middle East, all the while claiming that they were going off to fight for their country, you fools. desert scam. An old saying has it that familiarity breeds contempt. As a corollary to this, there should be another maxim. We are blind to that which we see so frequently. Most Americans, even though the spirit of America dwells with them, them are actually only dimly aware that the great seal of the first actually free country in the world shows an eagle a constellation of stars, an olive branch, and a set of thirteen arrows. This is the seal we all know. Symbolically, the eagle overshadows the land by its protective wings, but only as long as man proves worthy of such overshadowing or protection. Man has the power to destroy the eagle that overshadows or protects him. The constellation of stars indicates that the founders of America accepted the absolute law that has governed the drama of heaven since the beginning of the world and must be accepted and obeyed in this new world. The olive branch is the symbol of peace and friendship held out to all who are willing to forget and completely root out from their consciousness the degeneration of old worlds and elect to live in the spirit of the new world or the new age. The thirteen arrows are symbolic of the wars which are part of the drama in the heavens and the wars that must be waged against all evils as well as all evil individuals if man's freedom is to be maintained. It is each and every citizen's personal responsibility to eternally fight against these individual and universal evils. There is the prophetic reverse side of the seal, uncut because the time is not ready for the prophetic fulfillment which was known to few others than the philosophic initiates prior to its profane and premature use on the American one dollar certificate. Several attempts have been made to cut this reverse side of the seal, but in each instance an invisible hand or force restrained the effort. At the time of the Chicago World's Fair, this reverse side was ordered cut together with the familiar obverse side as an object of display, but those in charge, wholly ignorant of its meaning, and also ignorant of the spirit of true America questioned what a peculiar design. Why are we given this inartistic design? And this white stone symbolic of the nation's destiny as of the nation's true souls was once again rejected. The soul of America is betrayed and is in travail. Foreign inimical hordes are given almost unrestrained access into the country without a thought as to whether or not they are ready to throw off the gross, degrading, destructive evils of the old world and invest themselves with the spirit of the new with a wholehearted willingness to obey America's fundamental laws. Nor is that all. They are given high places, usurping the rights and privileges of those more capable born Americans wholly imbued with the true American spirit. If you have ears and you can hear, and eyes and you can see, you will begin to understand what the author is saying within a few more paragraphs, and you will be shocked. This helps bring about the gradual degradation of all that is truly American, so much so that the eagle whose wings overshadow America is gradually folding her wings and withdrawing heaven's protection. The time has come when a full knowledge of the twofold seal and all it stands for shall be made known to the people so they may accept and be protected or saved or ignore and be damned and swept into the sea of oblivion as have been other nations before America because they permitted foreign invasion and the adoption of destructive ideas to take the place of the constructive ideas 
which had made them great. America must awaken. She must be awakened by one means or another. Her own safety and the welfare of her own people must be protected against all foreign spawned ideologies born as the result of selfishness and defiance of God himself. And all his laws, laws which throughout the eons have preserved the world in the drama of heaven, through the peoples of nations unnumbered, have perished as a result of their own disobedience and degradation. America, its people, individually and collectively, must become valiant and now henceforth stand before the world as exemplars. They must be leaders and promulgators of a new and equitable system of ethics, religious inculcations based on sound material and spiritual truths, and a citizenship that is honorable and noble a justice and generosity to other nations that is unquestioned but without the weakness of cowardly compromise lacking all honor and fairness to her own people and emphasize the possibility of brotherhood based on individual personal freedom and obedience to laws that apply universally now to digress but vital to our thesis Late in the afternoon of July 14, 1776, the New Continental Congress resolved that Dr. Franklin, Mr. J. Adams, and Mr. Jefferson be a committee to prepare a device for a seal of the United States of America, all of these men, members of the mystery religion. The committee was identical with the one that had drawn up the Declaration of Independence, except for the omission of Robert Livingston and Roger Sherman. The declaration itself had been signed about two o'clock in the afternoon, and Congress desired to at once complete the evidence of the independence of the United States and of its people by formally adopting an official sign of sovereignty and national coat of arms. The coat of arms of England, the mother country, illustrated the union of Judah's lion with the unicorn of lost Israel. In accordance with the science governing heraldry, the young republic, born out of the throes of religious persecution, more than as a result of the sufferings of unjust taxation, was through, finished with thrones and crowns. It was ready to blaze a new path under the shadow of the eagle's wings through the forest of the new world in the cause of liberty which should express her descent from the spirit of the Christian peoples of all nations and open a door for all who sought help and shelter upon her shores. She rejected, she rejected British Israelism. She rejected the Lion of Judah. In the early colonial days, a knowledge of heraldry was considered an important part of education, just as throughout the ages it was necessary to have an understanding of symbolism which indicated a knowledge of the governing law of the universe and the drama of the ages and their effect on humanity, individuality, and collectively. It was through William Barton, son of the rector of St. James Episcopal Church of Philadelphia, learned in heraldry, and Baron Prestwich of England, that the designs expressive of America's destiny were developed and drawn. First, you must understand that the lion represents the tribe of Judah. Judah was not a part of the state of Israel. That is a historical fact, ladies and gentlemen. Israel was separate from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Our forefathers knew this. The British apparently do not, and neither apparently do identity Christians. The two sides of America's seal express in heraldry the countless ages of the evolution of man. This evolution had its beginnings even before the time of the so-called or misinterpreted fall of man. The seal symbolizes man's progress in Egypt, Eagle Land, 
America's actual fatherland, where for a time a wondrous race incarnated to build an unexplainable and inconceivable monument as a symbol of and memorial to the knowledge imparted to her by the more ancient Atlantis, and this is confirmation of everything that I've been telling you about the beliefs of the mystery religion. The ancient memorial, our altar, the Great Pyramid, unites in a blaze of glory with the later building of King Solomon's Temple as a prophecy of the coming of a master teacher, the Nazarene. He should be trained, taught, and initiated in the Eagle Land and bring into manifestation the human spiritual temple, perfecting the Son of Man into the Son of God as a fulfillment of ancient prophecy that in this same Egypt there should remain an altar where light should shine in the land of darkness. Another prophecy by Isaiah and symbolism connected the land of Egypt, or Eagle Land, with the land overshadowed by the wings of the Eagle America. Where there is an altar, Statue of Liberty, upon which is burning the light of freedom for all who accept the law and are worthy of their freedom. This great pyramid, an altar at the center of the earth, symbolic of man's spiritual or soul center, recognized as a temple of the highest initiation, was emblematic of the perfect man, four square of body, mind, spirit, and soul. Where have you heard? As I raised my hand to the square, or as I raised my arm to the square, it's why copestone symbolizes the attainment of immortality or cosmic consciousness, and you hear that throughout the New Age movement. It represents the measure of the earth as well as that of the universe, as also the evolution of physical man through those countless ages of reincarnation, now drawing to a restricted time, a time in which man will revert in his evolutionary path or will become gods. The last Kumain song now comes, wrote Virgil, and prophesies that a race should arise which would be the offspring of all races except those who isolated themselves and bring about the end of the ages of iron or war, ushering in the golden age, an age of honor, personal responsibility, and obedience to the divine law. It was therefore fitting that the mottos upon the reverse side of our seal above and below the pyramid should be taken from Virgil. Annuit Septus means prosperous in our daring, and Novus Ordo Seclorum means a new world order. It is well to constantly keep in mind the term select, because it is only the obedient, hence the select, that may or can reap the benefit of the reacting law. What unadulterated bullshit. Good night, and God bless you all.